Hey guys, welcome back to the channel and welcome back to the Supercharged CL175 build. This is going to be part four of our fuel injection series. In this video, I'm planning on covering quite a few different things and I'm really excited about it. Uh, the main things being a new charging system and an entire new uh, crank pulley design and supercharger pulley design. So we're just going to jump right into it. So in a previous video, I talked about how the charging systems on these bikes are hardly adequate enough for the stock system, let alone a full-on fuel injection system. So what I ended up doing was reaching out to Rick's Motorsports uh, out in New Hampshire. I'm sure any of you guys who work on these bikes probably know them. It's kind of the go-to company for uh, anything charging related. And I reached out and I just asked them if they had any system that I could possibly adapt to this bike to get, um, out, my goal was at least 11 amps, 11, 11 amps of output from the charging system. So after talking to the guys at Rick's, they were nice enough to send me their charging system for, it's actually for a CB350, uh, a new lithium uh, regulator rectifier and their hot shot rotor, which is awesome. So huge shout out to them. Uh, without them, I've, I was thinking I would have to go to a car alternator, a small race car alternator, but so having both the hotshot rotor and their lithium capable stator, it's gonna output about 210 watts as compared to about 80 watts that the stock system outputs. So 210 watts at 14 and a half volts is about 14 and a half amps of output, which is huge and it should be more than enough for what we need. So again, huge thanks to Rick's Motorsports for sponsoring us. It's been extremely helpful. So as you can see here, I already have the stator installed in the case. Um, like I said, it is for a CB350, so I had to make a few changes, but nothing drastic. Uh, the main one being the CL175 stator is tapped. The holes itself in the stator are tapped, uh, whereas the this stator um, meant for the CB350, they're not, they're just through holes. So I ended up having this locking ring made which is just a bunch of holes that are tapped in the pattern to hold it in. And I had to cut down a couple tabs and just minor stuff and it, it bolted right in, which is great. And the rotor, thankfully, is the same exact taper uh, between the two bikes, so that just bolted on. So today, we're gonna get this installed on the bike. Once we get that installed on the bike, I have all this stack of parts over here that need to get bolted on and I'll go through all of that. So first things first, I got to get the rotor actually torqued down because that's just kind of set in place at the moment. And we'll kind of jump through. We, we're going to have to jump back and forth between the new parts for the um, supercharger drive system, I guess you want to call it, and, and the charging system. Okay, hopefully you can see what I'm doing. So our new setup, we have this big spacer here, which on the old one, was only about an eighth inch. We went to about half an inch. And I'll show you why when we go to assemble everything. So this is just a 3D print. I have the aluminum piece here. This was made by Send Cut Send. Um, a lot of these parts you'll see today were made by Send Cut Send, which I'm not sponsored by them, but it's a great company. All you have to do is send your DXF files or whatever file structure you want to them. They'll cut out your parts and send them back to you. So we're gonna get this 3D printed part taken off and we'll install our aluminum one. So that's that little sub-assembly all put together. Okay, before we go installing that, I need to talk about what's going on over here. So what started all of this was two things. The main thing being, I was trying to figure out where to put the crank angle trigger wheel uh, on this bike. So for those who don't know, on fuel injected, fuel injected systems, the ECU needs to know where the engine is in its rotation. 
and a crank angle trigger wheel does just that. Essentially, you're going to have something like this. This is going to be your crank trigger wheel. And this bolts onto the crankshaft and rotates. And you can see it's got one missing tooth. And there's several different types of trigger wheels. This is just a missing tooth trigger wheel. Um, as, it, as this rotates, a sensor picks up each one of these teeth. In our case, it's going to be a Hall Effect sensor, which this isn't the one I'm going to be using, but this is very similar to it. And as each tooth passes, the Hall Effect sensor picks up that tooth and sends a signal to the ECU. So as it's going around, it's expecting a tooth at each one. When it misses one, that tells the ECU that the engine is starting its cycle over again. And the ECU can calculate, depending on the inputs you give it, it can calculate when to fire, um, it can calculate RPM, all that stuff. That's a very simple explanation if you want to learn more about crank angle sensors and trigger wheels and all that. I'm sure there's tons of good videos on it. Um, but anyways... Back to this. So when I was trying to design that and how to mount the crank trigger wheel, uh, I was running into I didn't have a good way to mount it where timing wouldn't wander. That's where the first piece comes in. So this is going to be the new piece we use to mount our pulley and trigger wheel. So this will bolt straight to the rotor, whereas the old way we were doing it was just this little piece here. I had this threaded into the end of the crankshaft and then the V-belt pulley set screw grabbed onto this little shaft. So obviously this isn't a great design. This just kind of got me going. But the problem with this is I can't put a trigger wheel on this because it threads into the end of the crank. So depending on how tight you thread it is going to change where your trigger wheel is and screw up your timing. So really this kind of drove this whole this whole redesign. So that's where this comes in. So now, instead of threading into the end of the crank, this will bolt right onto the rotor itself. Okay, so now we have our new crankshaft spindle installed. So now, instead of just something being threaded in, uh, and the timing being able to wander. Uh, this is bolted straight to the rotor, which is key to the crankshaft. And then there is a key way cut in here where our pulley and uh, crank angle trigger will all be mounted to, so we don't have to worry about timing wandering at all. So this is a much better setup. It took me a while to design this, but um, I, think it, I think it'll work out really well. We also have a hex on the end here where if we wanted to start the engine from the crankshaft, we can do that, get rid of the kickstart. So yeah, there's a lot of good benefits, but all right, we'll, we'll keep on moving on. Uh, next thing I can actually get the cover and um, the engine cover back on the bike with the stator. So this new rotor uses ne neodymium, neodymium magnets. I can't pronounce it. But anyways, the new rotor is much, much stronger than the old one. So here's the old one for reference. Uh, it's also bigger, uh, but the magnets are so much stronger. And the first time I was test fitting everything together, um, I didn't realize, and when I went to put this case on, uh, well, it almost took my fingers off. You just gotta be extremely careful. Yep, okay. God, I almost forgot. Uh, huge shout out to a friend of mine, Mike, uh, who machined this part for me. He's a land speed racer. He's got some badass builds he does. Um, he's also a machinist. So huge shout outs to uh, him for making this for me. All right, the next big piece we have to install is a new supercharger support plate, I guess you can call it. Um, this is our old one over here. There's a few issues with the old one. The main one being, you can see there's still like an oily film on this. So I didn't have any sort of seal going between the rotor and this main plate. Um, it was a real close fit, but still there was a fine mist of oil that would eventually get all over the place. So I wanted to rectify that. So 
the new one has a rotary seal, high-speed rotary seal that I've already installed. And in order to do that, I had to thicken up the plate a little bit. So this is now 3 eighths as compared to the quarter inch on the original. And then you can see I went ahead and the, the three bolt holes that hold it in place, I went ahead and countersunk those to keep the bolts out of the way, just something small. And you can see there's three more bolt holes now. So those are to mount our bearing support. Another deficiency with the old design was there was nothing holding or supporting the shaft coming out of the crankshaft. So all the load being applied to the pulley is then being applied way out on the end of the crankshaft, which is just asking to kill crankshaft bearings. So I'll get into that a little bit more when I install that, but that's what those holes are for. And on the back side, this little flower looking deal is just a locking ring. It's similar to what I did for the stator to install that. Um, this is just GB welded in place. And these three holes are tapped with M8 threads. And so our bearing support will eventually bolt into that. And the shape of this will contour to the half inch spacer that we just installed on the bike. All right, we got our new blower plate installed. Um, everything looks good. It's not too much different from the old one, so I expected everything to kind of go t together smoothly. Uh, now to get to the cool part. So you might remember we were using a V-belt pulley and V-belt to drive the supercharger in the last setup, and it really wasn't ideal just because you need so much tension on a V-belt uh, to be able to keep it from slipping. So we were at PRI uh, a couple months back. So PRI was beginning of December. Talked to the guys over at Jones Pulleys and just talked through uh, a few options. And we didn't end up getting anything through them just because it's such a custom setup. But they did say if you use a V-belt setup, it's like something crazy, like 60 pound, pounds of tension to keep it from slipping. And if you use a cog radius belt like this, it's something like five pounds. It's, it's a huge difference. So anyways, we are going to a cogged drive system, which I'm really excited about. So this is like, this is about an inch wide belt. It's eight millimeter pitch. And in, a, in order to run something like that, obviously we need um, cog drive pulleys. So for the lower pulley, it's going to be something simple like this. This is just a 3D printed one. I don't have, a, have it machined yet. So this, with a little spacer, go on to our lower spindle. Key will go right in this little slot. And this has got a little keyway in it. So eventually, obviously, this will be aluminum or steel, whatever I can find. That just slips on there, doesn't move. And then for the upper pulley or the supercharger, we did something kind of cool. So this is our new supercharger pulley hub. So this will get bolted straight onto the supercharger. And then we are actually going to run PETG solid printed pulleys. So having custom pulleys made is ex it's just, it's more expensive than what I can afford. So. We're gonna try this system. So these are PETG 3D printed pulleys at 100%, and I just designed them to lock into this hub. So you can see the pattern here, obviously the bolt pattern's the same, and then underneath you have these little tabs that lock in to the pulley. So just like the lower spindle, this is keyed. And go on just like that. Get our nut. And then all these little grooves line up with these cutouts. And should go something like that. Simple. 
simple as that. So obviously you can see on this one, it says 40. So this is the largest pulley I made. Uh, I, made them, I made them all the way down to 32. So I got a stack over here of different sizes. So obviously the largest pulley in this setup will make the least amount of boost. So with a 40 tooth upper, and I, this is a 16 tooth lower, should be around four pounds or so. And then with the 32 tooth and 16 tooth, I can't remember, I have to look at it again. I think it might be like 12 pounds of boost. And then if we wanna go above that, we just change this out for a slightly bigger pulley and jump up to the 40 again. And with, I think a 16, 18 and 20 lower, we have ranges from four PSI up to like 25 or something like that. But yeah, I'm super excited about this setup and I think it'll work. It's, um, these prints are strong and there's not a lot of tension on these belts, so I think they'll work well. The lower one though, since it's keyed, um, I think that keyway would waller out if I use the printed pulley, so we're actually gonna get that one machined. So the next thing we're gonna do, I'll get the idler pulley put on. This belt's a little long. I'll probably end up going ahead and ordering a slightly shorter one, but it'll work for the time being. All right, got our belt on. God, it looks so much better than the V-belt and it will work a lot better. And there's no chance or low chance of it actually skipping or slipping. <sighs> looks good. All right, next step. So I was talking earlier about our trigger wheel and this is our actual trigger wheel. So it's a 24 minus two teeth and it just goes on our lower spindle. And then this plastic part is just a timing hub for us to put timing marks on and allows us to indicate where the uh, engine is in its rotation. So this just slips, oh, whoops, I need a spacer. So we just gotta put this little spacer on and then this, our trigger wheel, just slide on there, put another spacer on and then put our nut on. All right, so the next thing we gotta do is put on our bearing support. Like I said earlier in the video, our last setup did, had no support on the end of the uh, lower pulley shaft and we've changed that. So this is just a plate with a bearing pressed into it and this will bolt to, this will slide onto the end of the shaft and bolt to our plate. So now our shaft is fully supported and we don't have to worry about the tension of the belt, applying too much load on the crankshaft itself. It should all be taken by this bearing, which will be nice. All right, we're almost there. Just gotta add our crank angle sensor and, oh, I almost forgot. Small piece, but necessary. So this little doohickey is our little timing pointer. And all it is is a little 3D printed piece. And I took a nail and cut it and then heat it up and pressed it in. So I have a nice sh sharp little point. And I'll get bolted right on here and it'll point to the edge of that wheel where we'll have our timing marks and it'll help us indicate timing. All right, I said I wasn't gonna do it in this video, but for completion's sake, we'll go ahead and do it. First thing we need to do now with the new setup, we have to find top dead center. And to do that, we are going to use a piston stop method. So it's pretty simple. All you have to do is use a little piston stop tool, which this is a old spark plug I took and cut it out and put a threaded rod through it and a nut. And you put this into the spark plug hole and this sticks down. And as you're rotating the engine, as the piston comes up, it'll tap and stop against this piston stop. You'll make a mark on your timing wheel and then you rotate the engine the other way and it'll come up and stop and you'll mark your timing wheel again. And then in between those two marks will be exact top dead center. But I'll do it and it'll probably make more sense. 
So we'll install our little top dead center tool. So all I'm gonna do now is slowly rotate the crankshaft counterclockwise until it stops against our top dead center tool. So I'm just going slowly because I don't wanna mash the piston into the stop. Okay, so you can see it stopped right there. So all I'm gonna do is make sure I'm right above it. I'm gonna take this little razor blade and make a score mark. So I'm using a razor blade because I want as a fine of mark as I possibly can get, just to be as accurate as I can be. So now I'm gonna rotate the engine slowly the other way and do the same thing. Whenever it stops, I'll go ahead and mark the timing wheel. All right, so it stopped right there. I'm gonna do the same thing. Score it. All right, so now I have two marks on the timing wheel. I have one right here where we just stopped and one right here. So top dead center is gonna be right in between those two marks. So I have this little piece of paper here that's timing tape that is custom for this wheel. So this is a three inch wheel. So you can go onto a site and I'll link it in the description. You can just type in what size your wheel is and it'll spit out the timing tape for it. So, sorry, this won't focus. So all I'm gonna do is just for the time being, I wanna see how far these two marks are apart. So I set my tape on it. So I have one at 10 degree and one, it looks like at one, two, three, four, at 19 degrees. So we have 29 degrees between them. So 29 divided by two, whatever that number is, 14 and a half. So I wanna go to, so there's 14, just past 14. It's gonna be there. So right at zero, I'm just gonna, Sorry if this is hard to see. Right at zero, I'm gonna score it. All right, that right there is our top dead center. So you go ahead and take the tool out and just for a sanity check, you can put a uh, flashlight down in the spark plug hole and as you rotate the engine, just make sure that it is obviously coming up to TDC. So now what I'm gonna do is just throw some spray adhesive on the back of this tape and line up zero with our mark for top dead center. And I'm just gonna glue it down. All right, got our timing tape on. So now when this indicator meets up with that zero, you'll know that the engine is at the top of its stroke. So this is just printer paper that I glued on there. I'll get, um, they have waterproof paper you can print on. So for the more permanent one, I'll go ahead and do that. But for now, um, this is just for, I guess, teaching purposes. <laughs> All right, so the last thing we gotta do is actually install the crank angle sensor, what this whole, what this whole thing was for. Um, so let's go ahead and get that sorted out. So the final piece of the puzzle and probably the most important piece of this entire build is this sensor right here. So this is our Hall Effect crank angle sensor. So this will pick up each one of those teeth on our trigger wheel and send that signal straight to our ECU. This is the bracket we're gonna be using. Again, it's just 3D printed. I still gotta actually make it. Sorry, a lot of these parts aren't actually made yet, but I wanted to get this video out. So here's our actual bracket. Just have a spacer for our sensor. And then the sensor, just go in there and get bolted down. All right, 
Got our crank angle sensor installed. You can see there's a little gap there, which is what you want. Well, I think that was the final piece of the puzzle for this whole setup. It looks like everything's gonna work out pretty well. Feels good to have this done. This is the result of a lot of thinking, a lot of redesign, a lot of time and effort. So uh, I'm happy it seemed to uh, work out. I think in the next episode, we're gonna go ahead and get the ignition coils mounted. Um, a few other little things, cylinder head temperature sensor, fuel pump relay, main relay. I think that's the last of the things that need to get mounted before we can actually start doing the wiring harness. In the next video, I know a lot of people have been asking, I will show the ECU and harness I'm gonna be using. A lot of you probably already know which one I'm gonna use, but we'll get into that in the next video. Um, but I appreciate you guys sticking around this long. If you've stuck around this long, I know this is a longer video. Um, I also really want to thank Bricks Motorsports for uh, sponsoring the build. It's been extremely helpful. I'll put the link to their site in the description. If you guys need anything charging related, um, they do other things as well. Be sure to check them out. But until next time, thanks for watching. See you later.